Hello everybody and welcome to this launch of Equity's Guide to Good Practice with British Sign Language in the Arts. And this covers theatre, television and film and all elements of the arts. A huge, huge thanks to Equity for making this event happen and agreeing to work in partnership with Alim Jada and also with ourselves at Definitely Theatre. We're so proud that this event has happened today and the launch of this guide is happening. It's amazing, really. We now know that 247 people have signed up to this live event. So that's fantastic to see a lot of interest in this guide to good practice in BSL in the arts. And just to let you all know, you can obviously watch it now and you can also watch it via the live stream on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube and it will be available after as well. I should say that today we have two sign language interpreters working with us. One is Kathy, who's uh, on screen with me now, who just waved. And uh, we also have another interpreter called Susan Booth, who will pop up at various moments during the session. She'll uh, both, they'll take turns either speaking into English or uh, translating into British Sign Language for all the various participants. I suppose to give you an idea of today's session and uh, the running order and what's going to happen in the next 90 minutes or so, first of all, we're going to be welcoming our first panel, three wonderfully talented deaf actors, to talk about their own experiences that they've faced in the industry over the past few years and what barriers they've faced. I'm going to be talking to them about BSL representation and why it's so important to have a guide like this. And then we will welcome Alan Jada to talk about the guide itself as the co-author of the guide. Alan is an amazing accomplished actor and he's worked so hard and been incredibly committed to creating this guide. He's consulted with a variety of deaf people, deaf organisations, ourselves at Definitely Theatre, to make sure that these guidelines are the best for everybody. I've seen so much passion from him in making this happen. So he's going to come on and talk about the guide. And it's thank you to him uh, for uh, achieving it and with the support from Definitely Theatre and also support from Equity. And we're really grateful to have that support from Equity today. And then after that, I'm going to be welcoming four theatre industry professionals to talk about their experiences of employing deaf actors in their various productions and also their passion and why they feel it's so important to have a guide like this to get good practice in the use of British Sign Language in the arts. And then it's over to you. We'll have a question and answer session with you all here today. And please feel free if you have a question during the session, you see at the bottom of your Zoom page, there's a function called Q&A. You can type your question in the Q&A there anytime uh, throughout the session, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can, obviously time permitting. And please don't worry about your English language level. If that's a barrier for you, please just put your question as best you can. And we'll aim to finish today's session at half past 12. Just also to say, please share this information. Please tweet about the launch of this guide. Please use the hashtag EquityBSL. That's the hashtag that we're using, uh, EquityBSL, to support and publicize this guide. So please pass it on to your social media networks and tell as many people as you can. But first, before I invite my first panel, I'd like to firstly welcome Neil Fox Roberts who is a deaf representative on the Deaf and Disabled Members Committee for Equity, just to say a few words first of all. So, welcome Neil. Hello everybody, says Neil, hello. My name is Neil Fox Roberts. My sign name is this, Neil, like a fox. <laughs> and I have been working for the last 27 years in the business as an actor and I've experienced many different ways of working, whether that's in theatre rehearsals, on tour, in rep, 
TV and film. I've worked as a translator. Uh, I've worked as an actor. And translation is so important. And good practice in BSL is so important throughout all of the arts. It's been a real pleasure working with Alim and Paula at Definitely Theatre to really launch this BSL guide. It's been absolutely a pleasure, I have to say, uh, working uh, with Alim Jada and with uh, Paula Garfield from the Definitely Theatre, the artistic director, uh, creating this guide over the past few months. And you know they have been the creative leads for this guide. And it's really important that we get publicity and promotion about this guide out today. So a big thanks to Alim and to Paula. I am sure that many creative professionals, casting directors, theatre directors and producers are going to find this guide informative and really an essential resource. It is so important. Please tell other people about it. Tell your friends, colleagues, via your social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And please use hashtag equity BSL. Thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy this panel this morning. Bye-bye from me. I'll pass back now to Paula. Thank you to Neil. And I should say, as I said before, if you have any questions about equity, or maybe yourself would like to join equity, please contact Neil Fox Roberts as your deaf representative on that committee. And so now I am so excited to welcome my first panel. They are three incredibly talented deaf actors and I've worked with all of them. So I'm very proud of all of them and I'll let them explain about their experiences that they've been through, the barriers that they've faced through the industry and how they've broke through those barriers. They have credits at Shakespeare's Globe. They have theatre credits on the West End. They have numerous TV and film credits. So I'd like to now welcome Sophie Stone. Hello. I'd now Thank like to welcome me. Nadia Nadaraja. Welcome, Nadia. Hello. Hello. Hello, Nadia. And finally, I'd like to welcome Julian Pedal Kalu. Welcome to Julian. Hello, says Julian. Oh, hello from Paula. <laughs> Lovely to see you all, says Paula here. I'd like to start with my first question to Sophie Stone. May I ask about what barriers you have faced within the in industry? You're obviously an actor who is deaf. Over to you, Sophie. Before I became a performer, I went to drama school and went through the audition process. And they were very unused to having a deaf person turn up. So there I was trying to get through the audition process itself. I tried twice and found that the second time their awareness of having a deaf person in the audition was improved. And I thought that the world post drama school would be the same as it had been in drama school. So if there was a casting notice that said they needed a deaf actor um, who spoke well or had a voice, I would think, what does that mean? And I would turn up for an audition and realize that no interpreters were provided or there was no real understanding of how to use the camera in order to represent BSL correctly and it completely knocked my confidence. It felt like a very inequitable process where a hearing actor could come in, pretend to be deaf, sign a little bit. And it felt that the barriers were already in place because there had been no consideration for a deaf performer turning up and feeling that they had an equal presence in the room. And it's almost like the way that they treat deaf actors is, oh, you should listen harder, or you can't be part of this particular game. So perhaps if you want to sit over there and wait. So there's nothing about character development. It's just about sitting and waiting. And there's not an opportunity to grow and develop and feel 
absolutely a part of the team in the room. I always felt like an outsider and that frustration was, was immense. And I still feel that now. Sometimes it's a tick box exercise. It's about bringing a deaf actor in, but there's no thought as to how to support that actor once they're in place. And it feels like we're constantly fighting for everything that we need, which then in turn makes us look difficult because we're not being represented properly. I do agree there, Sophie. Thank you for sharing that experience. I'd now like to ask uh, Nadia Ladaraja, have you experienced similar things in the industry? Yes, as, as Sophie has mentioned, I've had similar experiences in the audition process. And sometimes they may say, oh, are you available tomorrow? So if there's a, a role for a deaf character with a deaf voice or whatever they request, they contact you and say, OK, are you available tomorrow? But then I have to remind them about the need for a BSL interpreter. And they are people that you can only book perhaps two weeks in advance. So then it's up to me to try and find somebody. Then I ask them who's going to pay the fee for the interpreter because they're not free. Is that going to be my responsibility? Or is it you because you've decided that one of your characters is going to be deaf? Have you considered bringing in an interpreter? So then I ask them, are you going to book somebody? And then there's this response of, oh, I don't know. They haven't really taken that on board. So essentially then I read a casting notice and I have all of this extra responsibility. Perhaps I receive the information 11 o'clock the night before, the audition is 10 o'clock the next day, I don't sleep preparing and I'm worried about whether an interpreter is going to be available or even turn up. So I spend time trying to contact people. Sometimes they have to come from far away or we have to use them remotely and then we've got to consider things such as will, will the tech work? And it, actors like to prepare in the same way as interpreters like to prepare, and that takes time. So if they advise me four to five days before an audition that it's going to take place, I can prepare, I can prepare with the interpreter. And then on the day, it feels like the process is much smoother, but that never feels like that happens. So that's a real issue. Thank you for that, Nadia, sharing that experience. I'd like to ask now, ask Julian, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing some of your experiences. Julian. I've had very similar experiences to Nadia and um, Sophie, but uh, interestingly enough, um, I, some productions are nervous of using deaf actors and they're nervous of sign language and how sign language will, will work. And, and I'm not anti this, but they bring in, you know, a lot of deaf children because, you know, maybe they have a couple of lines and it's an easier job. Uh, and then, you know, the adults then take responsibility for speaking for uh, the children. So, Opportunities for kids, that's wonderful, but opportunities for other people? And is that bringing them in for the wrong reasons? Because obviously, you know, deaf children perhaps don't have that language vocabulary yet either. So there are sort of, you know, then less opportunities for adult deaf actors. And, you know, I also see casting notices where they want deaf people who speak, and that's fine. Uh, you know, deafness is a, a you know, a, a wide variety of things. We need to represent everybody. Not everybody uses sign language, not everybody speaks. But I think sometimes it's just brought in for ease of communication. I can then speak directly to this actor, they can speak back to me. And sometimes I think, you know, if you use a BSL using actor and then an interpreter, oh, going through that triad is uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a worry. It's uh, stressful, but you know, you can, you can do it. You can easily achieve it. You know, it, it's not a, a huge hurdle to overcome. And that's why this guide, I'm so pleased to see it so that it's a valuable resource that people will be able to use uh, in the industry going forward. Paula, the next question I'd like to ask everybody is why do you think it is so important to have good BSL representation in the industry? I'll go to Nadia first. A very similar response to Julian about representing our community in the UK. There are 150,000 deaf sign language users across the UK. And we are visible in terms of using that language. So if you're walking around going to work, going shopping, you will see deaf people out there on the street. We're not hidden away. If you don't see that on television, in film, on stage, you can't do that without including sign language authentically. And there are more hearing people using sign language, but we should be represented correctly. If you think about the community, you can't assume that there are just deaf people who speak within the community. It's a wide spectrum of deaf people. 
it's a, it's a country that needs to have its, its ESL represented accurately and authentically. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, over to Julian now to add his comments. Julian, I absolutely agree with Nadia. Over the lockdown, we've seen uh, interpreters on BBC News. We've seen, uh, uh, you know, perhaps public service announcements, um, you know, hosp hospitals, etc. Et they don't really represent deaf people and their real lives. Deaf people, you know, we are in um, any jobs, you know, there are deaf people that work in forensic science. There are, um, you know, deaf people that work uh, in Interpol. Uh, there are deaf people that work in uh, the police, in the fraud investigation team, in, you know, um, computer forensics, etc. Um, there are, whereas TV programmes don't represent that. And I think uh, that's, you know, on TV, we don't see the, you know, that wide spectrum of deafness. And you know, there are deaf midwives, there are deaf occupational therapists, there are deaf psychiatrists, there are deaf psychologists. But again, they're not represented on uh, film and, you know, on TV programmes. You know, we only see uh, a really small element uh, of deaf people. We need more representation, absolutely. Paula, may I now go to Sophie uh, to add her comment? I do feel that there is a lot of focus on a deaf person being a role model uh, for deaf children, deaf young people, young actors who are going through the process of learning. But the other way around, where is the support for the, the deaf native um, that has sign language um, and is in a powerful role, can feel confident on stage, um, that, that they are seen? And there's very little of that. If I talk about myself, I am an oral deaf person who uses sign language and I've done that on screen, but many of the requests that I have in my acting profession ask me to speak and sign at the same time. Well, that's not BSL, that's sign supported English. And it seems to be that it's serving, the, the story should serve the hearing and the deaf participants at the same time. But for a native signer, a deaf actor who feels that I deserve my time on stage, on television, on film, I need to have that equity and there's so few opportunities for those deaf native users of BSL. I do fully agree with those comments and uh, Sophie brought up a fundamental issue there about role models, role models for children and young people. You know, I grew up believing that I would become an adult, uh, a hearing adult when I, I turned 16 because, you know, my parents were hearing and I even told my mum that when, I, when I'm an adult, I'm going to become hearing because I had never seen a deaf adult uh, either on television or uh, you know, in, in my life. And that's why we need role models uh, in the industry. It's so important uh, to, to share that and to give that experience to deaf children and young people. Can I just ask you all to comment why you feel this guide is so important to share in the industry? I, I see a lot of nods, but why is it that it's so important? Um, Nadia first, please. Oh, completely. Based on my experience, um, I've been in very reputable theatres where I've been invited to join as a deaf actor amongst a hearing ensemble, and they're often unprepared. They book the interpreters. I have no quibble about that. The service is very good, but the hearing actors can't sign. And if there's a character where perhaps I'm playing the sister of a character, they don't sign, and then I'm asked to teach the actor to sign. I'm an actor, not a teacher. And then they ask the interpreters, can you teach this actor sign language? No, they are interpreters. They need to be contacting the correct people. So if you want to learn sign language, contact a teacher of sign language. In the same way that if when you learn English, obviously I have BSL as my first language and I'm learning English so that I can communicate with you. So you need to take the time to learn my language. And often in the rehearsal process, there isn't that time. So in terms of my own character development as an actress, that gets um, impacted. So it's so key that this guide exists. Thank you for that, Nadia. And I have to say, um, I don't believe Nadia's experience is unique to her. I think that's quite common amongst multiple deaf actors. Um, Sophie, I'd like to invite you to comment now. I think also if we talk about the translation period, um, it's worth 
realizing that there is a huge burden to look at the English script and translate that into BSL in a way that ensures that it's understood and it is intelligible to those watching. And the meaning in English has to be incorporated within that BSL translation, otherwise you lose the sense of the story and audiences will miss out on the information, particularly with Shakespeare, which is a very complicated style of text that takes more time. And often people will bring in deaf actors because they feel that that's great in terms of advancing deaf actors in their career, but they haven't thought about um, the language that they use. They might say, or oh, hearing impaired, or the capital D, lowercase d, deaf. So what the guide does is give a go-to document where they can learn and adapt the language that they use, how they describe individuals in their casting calls. It may be that it might say, oh, you must have a voice. Is that important? Are you expecting deaf actors to come and use a voice which naturally is not something that they would do? So what is your reason for that? What's the, what's the reason in your piece that that person has to use their voice? Is it to show the world that that person is deaf? But if they use sign language, doesn't that show that anyway? So what the guide does is give give a sense of what you should be doing, but also gives them the confidence to, to ask the right questions. So whether that's asking a deaf person or an interpreter uh, the right questions to reduce that burden that deaf actors feel every time they walk into a rehearsal room. You know, the time that they want to focus on their acting, their character development, it doesn't happen because that burden is always given to them. So what the guide does is remove that burden it, it feels like it takes the pain away. Uh, thank you for that, Sophie. Just to say, we've got a couple of minutes in this uh, panel. Uh, Julian, I'd like to uh, ask you to respond to this question now. Julian, I'd like to support what Sophie and I have just said. And the guide also has contacts for people. I think previously people were unsure about where to find resources, where to find uh, deaf organisations, interpreters, BSL monitors, BSL teachers. And I think now that this resource is here, it's got that contact in it. And also, you know, there's plenty support of support in the creative community. There are qualified BSL monitors, actors, there's a lot of talent there. But, you know, there's also um, you know, good interpreters out there that will really elevate your production, your play, your film, your, your TV project, whatever it is. We, we all will support each other, but having the document is so important to have this reference. Paula, thank you. Sophie, thank you. Nadia, thank you, Julian, for your contributions. They are incredibly valuable to show why a guide like this is so important and what barriers you have faced in your careers. Thank you again. And I, I will see you later for the Q&A. And uh, you'll stay there, but you're just going to be switching your videos off. So bye-bye for now. Excellent, thank you. So the next part of this session is for me to introduce to you all Alan Jader. Alan is an established actor and also a qualified sign language interpreter. I've actually worked with him. He's a brilliant actor, I should say. And I've also worked with him as an interpreter and he's a brilliant interpreter as well. He's also a CODA, that acronym means Child of Deaf Adults. So he has seen uh, these frustrations firsthand, these sort of stories from Julian, Sophie and Nadia. And he's also seen the experiences of his own family and friends. So it galvanized him into action to create these guidelines to hopefully make change in the industry. A huge thanks should go to Alim for making this happen. And I was so delighted to collaborate with him on this project. So hello, Alim, please um, pop up now and uh, say a few words to introduce yourself hello. and the guide. Hello, Alim. Over to you now, please introduce yourself. That was such a lovely introduction. You're very kind. Thank you, Paula. Hello, everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for signing up to this event. There are so many people participating and I'm really overwhelmed. Um, not only those that have signed up to the webinar, but also watching the live streams. So my name is Alan. 
and I am the creator and author of this guide. I'm an actor and I'm a qualified sign language interpreter. And I also happen to be hard of hearing. Before I talk about the guide and what that contains, I just wanted to put that on hold for a moment and give you a little bit of a background about myself and also give you some context as to why sign language representation is so important. I was born to parents who were both profoundly deaf, so I am a CODA, the acronym C-O-D-A, which means child of deaf adults. I was born hearing and I lost my hearing a few years ago. Sign language was my parents' first language, their language, and it was also my first language. My first word was in VSL, and I dream in sign language too. My father was born in Africa, in Tanzania. My mother was born in London. They both received very little education. For my father, the education process in Africa was difficult because of the cultural attitudes towards disability at that time. Disabled people were oppressed and forced into manual labor. So he would work on cars and he started work at the age of 11. He hadn't yet acquired a full sign language. It was more a pigeon form of sign language. For my mom, who's living in a first world country in England, she still received a very minimal level of education. She was going to school in the 60s and 70s. And at that time, the education system for deaf children specifically was appalling. They were advocating not sign language, but the oral approach. So it was all about learning to speak with the intention being that deaf people would fit into hearing society better that way. And there are now thousands of deaf adults like my mum who are not able to read, not able to write. My mum and dad, who are both in their 60s now, in terms of their reading age, it is the equivalent to a four-year-old. They can't read, they're not able to write. So if you give them something to read in English, they will fail. They will not be able to access it. If you give them something in sign language, they will fly. My dad came to the UK. At the time there was, he wanted to come here to learn maths. There was a college where deaf people could go, he could learn and fit into society and also learn sign language at the same time. Sign language is a minority language. So what do we mean when we describe it as a minority language? What I'm talking about is oppression. It has experienced years and years and years of oppression that still continues to this day. It was one of the first languages in the world in terms of its heritage. And it came along before speech, but it's oppressed. How can that be? Also many years ago, for deaf people to come together, have a relationship, their children, that was not allowed. So I'm referring to the, to the notion of eugenics, where when people want to remove certain types of people, such as disabled people, then they're not allowed to reproduce. They weren't allowed to have relationships with one another. And just to say over the last few years, when I've been going to hospital about my own hearing loss, I requested a blood test because I wanted to know if my hearing loss was related to a genetic condition. And I was told that I couldn't do that. I could only have a blood test if I was considering having children. Then they would take a blood test and check whether it was genetic. 
So I thought, okay, the only reason you want to check is because you don't want me to have children in case I pass this on to another child. So is this eugenics occurring today? So I talked about deaf people not being able to have relationships, being forced to speak, sign language being forbidden. And you think I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of years ago in the 18th century. I'm not. I'm talking about much more recently than that. In some schools, if the children use sign language, their hands would be hit with a ruler or they'd be forced to sit on their hands. These are the stories that my, my, my mum has told me and they are awful stories to hear. And this is still happening in British deaf schools. Punishment for signing, being forced to speak. My father in Africa had his hand put in a fire because he was waving his hands around and they thought that he would look like a monkey. And there are medical professions who are advising parents who have had their child recently diagnosed as deaf, that they shouldn't be encouraging the use of sign language because it will hinder their development. It'd be much better for them to learn to speak. But actually what, re what research actually says is that having sign language alongside speech assists development, not hinders it. Moving on to the political field, back in 2003, Sign language was recognized, but it doesn't have an equivalent recognition to that of spoken languages. In Scotland, the BSL Act of 2015 has meant that local authorities have to develop a plan as to how they will promote, how they will raise awareness of sign language, and how that relates to deaf people's rights to use it. That doesn't happen in, in, in England. So that's one of the reasons why representation is so important. If we see sign language represented on television, in film, on stage, and it's represented in the highest quality, then that has an influence, it has a ripple effect. It means that politically the culture will change. There's a fantastic play that was originated in America and they're looking for a theatre to perform it called Movements of the Soul, which is about the first deaf university in America, in Gallaudet. And it, it talks about oppression and it talks about language. So, why have we produced this guide? There are many actors, both past and present, who are playing deaf characters. If they're not, they play a hearing character who can sign. But the quality of their sign language is poor, it's unintelligible, nobody understands what they're saying. And their dexterity is not there either. Years ago, my mum watched a television programme and there was a hearing actor signing. And my mum signed the phrase, my language take. And I wondered what she meant about my language take. And it wasn't until years later that she was referring perhaps to cultural appropriate misappropriation. And we are fighting for our language and yet a hearing person takes it and uses it inappropriately. And it's, we're talking about deaf people's access to the language. Hearing people don't need the sign language. So if you have poor representation, what does that say? So that's why it's sign language and deaf people are passionate about their language. I'm passionate. I want to make sure that it's represented on the screen and on the stage in the best way possible. So how was this guide created? Two years ago, I did some rather venting tweets talking about hearing actors using sign language in such a poor way that I could not understand them. I also identified that in theater and in television, sign language was being used in a tokenistic way. Following my tweets, I was approached by the stage asking if I would write an article. So I wrote the article and then I contacted Spotlight and asked that levels of BSL be put 
on your profile. So whether that was your level one up to stage six, or if you were a qualified interpreter, so people could see what your level of BSL was. I realized there was a hunger out there. People, people in the industry are not bad people. They want to make changes, but it's the knowledge that's lacking. So they are relying on deaf people to be their teachers and advisors. So the idea of coming up with this document, this guide, that I worked with Paula, with Definitely Theatre, with Equity, and also a number of brilliant deaf people, and we had the most phenomenal discussions. And we want to make this a go-to document. So what's in the guide? There's information as to where to find deaf actors, audition breakdowns, how to get them out there to those deaf actors that you want to cast, terminology in terms of what's correct and incorrect, understanding the spectrum of deafness and what that means. Also interpreters, how to find them, what you're specifically looking for, how to book them. Also when you're casting hearing actors for hearing roles, remember, not deaf roles, who have sign language and you're wanting to identify the level that they're using. Because if a hearing actor is skilled in sign language, they have the ability to reflect that in the character that they're portraying because they can adjust. Also the importance of BSL monitors who can um, monitor the sign language being used. And also translators, deaf people who are very skilled at translating from English into sign language. Remember this document is, is not set in stone. It's a live, ever evolving document. The more comments we get, the more it will improve. So we want you to work together with us. And if you have any ideas of what we should include in the guide, they can be added. The guide is your guide. And I want deaf people to be able to refer to this and hearing people to read it and understand it and also refer to it and use, use it as a, as a reference point. It gives you a tool in terms of understanding why representation of BSL is so important. So please share this with all of your networks. Please use our hashtag EquityBSL. And my final word would be, I'd like to go back to the oppression of deaf people and sign language that I say still exists. It's not something that occurred in the 18th century. It's so important to have good representation of BSL. And working together, we have the power to make a change. And this can be a ripple effect across education, across politics. But the responsibility is for all of us. Can you imagine if they cast a Spanish person who had the most basic level of English to play a native English character? How would you feel about that? That's exactly what is happening to deaf actors. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for being here. And I hope that 2020 will be the beginning of great change. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Alim, for that powerful and passionate speech. And I completely agree with you. Uh, the oral education system has failed thousands, if not millions of deaf children. And I am one of them as well. I was taught through the speaking and listening approach. And if I tried to sign, I was punished and I was called a monkey, uh, as you just shared that your parents were. And that was incredibly damaging. And I grew up with that and my self-esteem was very low. I left school at 17 with an equivalent reading age of a hearing child of eight. And that severely impacted my life. And I do have to say that working in theatre has saved my life because it's the only place I feel free to express myself freely via sign language. And I do agree with everything that what you've said. And I do hope that these guidelines do affect change 
because a lot of deaf people have been suffering for so long and it's now time to make this change. Thank you, Alim, for those powerful words. Oh, love you, lots of love to you. Okay, so moving on now to the next part of this discussion, I would like to introduce four brilliant people who are on our industry panel. They have either worked with deaf actors and BSL or shown a great level of great practice and passion for including good BSL in their work. I'm now very excited to welcome them and I'll just name them uh, individually. Firstly, uh, welcome to Amy Leach, the Associate Director at the Leeds Playhouse. Hello, Amy. Thank you for popping up there. <laughs> Next, I would like to invite Kerry Michael to join us, please. Kerry is a freelance director. Hello, Kerry. And previously the artistic director of the Theatre Royal Stratford East. So welcome, Kerry, to this discussion. Now, I'd like to invite Faye Timby to join us, please. Faye is a associate with Sophie Holland Casting. So welcome Faye. Hello, thank you for joining us. And unfortunately, we were due also to be joined by Erica Wyman from the Royal Shakespeare Company, but unfortunately she's unable to join us today due to technical issues. Uh, Erica, as I'm sure many of you know, is the uh, Deputy Artistic Director of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and I, I believe she has sent a comment that we will be able to read uh, later on. So unfortunately, uh, she won't be joining us today. But thank you so much uh, to my three members of this panel. I really appreciate you joining us. You have huge power to make great influence and I am thrilled to have you here. I'm going to direct my first question to Amy, if that's okay. Now, Amy, your siren is this. Have I got it right? Amy, wonderful. Oh, that's great. You're good to know. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the first question I'd like to ask you, you recently directed a production of Oliver Twist. Uh, obviously, uh, did I get the sign right for that? Excellent. That's great. Thank you. Oliver Twist, wonderful, which had fantastic representation of British Sign Language within it uh, and a variety of deaf actors involved and it was brilliant to see so many uh, deaf actors involved in one production. I'm so sad that your run was cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I do hope it will come back, maybe you can share that with us in a moment. Um, but what was your experience like in preparing for the auditions particularly and finding actors uh, who could sign? That's the question that I would uh, like to ask you, please, Amy. Great, thank you. Yeah, so um, I should first of all say it's really emotional hearing everybody who's spoken so far because um, really, to my shame, I only started really properly working with BSL users about three years ago. Um, and I'm kind of quite ashamed that I didn't start before because it's been absolutely, um, it's fundamentally changed my practice and added so much to um, everything that I've been making and creating. Oliver Twist was a really special production because we commissioned a brand new adaptation of that story and the reason one of the reasons we did that was we acknowledged that particularly for BSL users where BSL is somebody's first language the density of Dickens text is quite inaccessible and what we wanted to do was develop a brand new adaptation and we worked um, from the very first moments of writing that adaptation with deaf artists, actors, consultants to make sure that we were thinking about BSL um, in the characters in that story, um, in how it was written and also about how um, deaf history might have impacted on characters living in the late Victorian era so we thought about the pressures of the Milan conference, the things that everybody's talked about in terms of education. So when we came to auditions, 
how we set those up was we started with workshop auditions rather than going straight into kind of one-to-one um, auditions. And that was fantastic. What that meant is we could bring groups of people together and they were a mix of um, deaf artists, disabled artists, non-disabled artists, all coming together with interpreters. Um, we also made sure that there was always a deaf person there as a consultant um, to make sure that there was an outside pair of eyes who could check people's sign language, who were um, representing the deaf community in that process. And so we had workshop auditions. And what those meant is that we weren't instantly relying on people to just look at text. We were actually looking at people's storytelling, their ensemble playing. We knew that the show needed to be very visual. So we were thinking about that in those auditions. And also also, those auditions started to inform then some of the ways that the script developed as well. And after that, we then did sh- uh, kind of one to one auditions where, again, we had our BSL consultant present and interpreters. Um, we also offered people the opportunity to um, sign their auditions. We explored visual vernacular within that as well. Um, and that meant we could really um, support people to do their best work in those auditions as well. And like you say, we ended up, yeah, with six different deaf actors in Oliver Twist across a real spectrum um, of deafness um, in that as well, which is really exciting and it meant we were able to really represent deaf stories within the context of Oliver Twist and it had a massive impact on uh, the story that we told so yeah thank you Amy for that and I do hope that Oliver Twist will come back uh, I heard so much fantastic feedback before I got the chance to see it so I do hope it comes back very soon thank you for that sharing um, I'm going to turn to Kerry now, if that's okay. Now, Kerry, your surname is this, I believe. Is that right? As in um, Greek? Is that right? Okay, phew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Oh, that... <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm going to make sure I got it right. Um, you were the director of Tommy, the musical. Uh, you know, obviously a huge production uh, under the Rants to the Moon consortium. Uh, it was extraordinary, an extraordinary production. So can I ask you, Kerry, what was it like working with BSL in a musical, particularly, and also working with deaf actors uh, in, in Tommy, if you wouldn't mind sharing. And I have to say, it's one of the most amazing productions that I've seen for a long time featuring uh, deaf and hearing actors. Over to you, Kerry. Oh, thank you, Paula. That was lovely. Um, and it- Likewise with Amy, it's lovely to be here and see so many lovely familiar faces. Um, Tommy was probably one of the most exciting things I've ever done. It was a coming together of so much that kind of worked. And it was um, two things. One was the whole piece was about communication. The whole show was about, the themes were about how you communicate, when you choose to communicate and when you choose not to communicate, which was what the lead protagonist Tommy did. So um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, it was a musical, which, it, which in some ways is a, it's a, it's a mad idea to try and um, uh, add um, BSL inside a very complicated form anyway. But what it did was it enhanced the entire process. In a musical, you can either tell a story through a scene, through music, through dancing, um, and in this case, also through BSL. So we had even more options in terms of how we wanted to tell the story. And that meant we had to be more vigorous in our choices, which made me a better director. Um, The interesting, the most exciting thing about um, the BSL for me was um, how BSL doesn't follow the the structure of how we speak in in, in English. And it's it's got its own structure. And sometimes we wanted to kind of work with that. And sometimes we went against that and we went for like um, sign supported English, depending on what we were doing. We were able to cast um, uh, um, seven dancers who were deaf. Mark Smith, our choreographer, took the BSL and incorporated it into into the movement of the piece, um, which enhanced every lyric we had. It made me work harder as a director to understand, well, when we talk about the character being the acid queen, what do we mean by the word acid queen? And um, the deaf actors, the the um, uh, uh, the interpreters were all, were all, we were, a debate would mean what by what we mean by acid, or is that, is that the drug? Is it something that corrodes something? What do we mean by queen? Is it the king of the queen of the castle? 
we cast an actor, Peter Strake, to play that part, who um, is, is, is a cis man. So I'll be talking about their sexuality. All these questions were coming up through the piece because we were incorporating this other layer of communication in the piece, which was BSL and, and with Bet Actors. So, it, so the thing about the diversity thing meant that we all had to up our game and be even more precise and, give, and it gave us another level of, of opportunity and excitement in telling the story. And that's why the piece kind of worked so well in, in its elevation because of all these other elements in, in the room. Thank you, Kerry. And it's real proof there that sign language doesn't have any limitations in a production. It actually can enhance. And, you know, BSL can be used in a musical, which, you know, you wouldn't usually put the two together, for example. But um, it's great to sort of think about that and that there are no limitations to what BSL can do in performance. Thank you, Kerry, uh, for sharing that. I'm now going to pass on to Faye. Uh, welcome, Faye, and thank you so much for joining this panel. In regards to lockdown, I know that you recently set up four sessions where you had uh, one-to-ones, I believe, with uh, deaf actors online. And that's uh, fantastic that you did that. And can I ask, was that your first experience of meeting deaf actors, uh, you know, obviously online uh, as, a, as a casting director? And what have you really taken from that experience and how was it for you? Over to you, Faye. Hi, Paula. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so actually, Alim is a very dear friend of mine and um, I work um, for Sophie Holland and we'd set up some one-to-ones with actors. So I reached out to Alim um, for his help um, to virtually connect with um, deaf actors from, from all over the UK and also to hear about the struggles that they face, not just within the industry, but within sort of day-to-day -day life. Um, and that was my first experience of meeting with deaf actors. Um, my first experience of watching a deaf actor um, was on stage and that was only in 2018 when I saw um, lovely Charlotte Arrowsmith uh, play Cassandra in Troilus and Cresta at the RSC. Um, and I remember the next day actually I wrote to um, Helena Palmer, who was the casting director, to congratulate her um, on her work. I just thought the casting was inspired. And then that kind of came full circle because I was able to um, connect with Charlotte during isolation and tell her how beautiful I thought her performance was. But I think from speaking to her and to other deaf actors, what I realized is that those opportunities are few and far between. Um, and I learned a great deal. And, you know, I found out that, for example, the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland is the only drama school in the world which offers a course for deaf actors. And so one of the reasons I'm here today to speak is because I think that that needs to change because I worry about the effects that that will have on talent that casting offices have access to um, in the long term. Um, but I also think that, you know, like so many of us in our industry, I want to be part of the changes that we need to see with regards to the representation of marginalized communities. And I hope that this document that Alim has created will hopefully empower, you know, not just casting directors, but the industry as a whole to seek out and help um, champion deaf talent in the hope of giving deaf actors um, a much needed platform and just more visibility on stage and screen. Thank you so much for that response, Faye. I really do appreciate that uh, answer and how wonderful that you gave those actors that experience to have that uh, online meeting with you. It's very rare, unfortunately, for a deaf actor to meet a casting director and to have that opportunity, you know, to have that one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm so pleased that Alan was able to influence you. He is an incredibly inspiring person, isn't he? So uh, yes, well done. Well done to Alan. Um, my next question, uh, is, uh, well, I should say, first of all, uh, Erica Wyman was supposed to join this uh, panel, the uh, Deputy uh, Artistic Director of the RSC, but unfortunately couldn't make it due to technical issues. And I believe Alan might have a statement. Oh, he's just popped up uh, to read on Erica's behalf. Oh, Alan, you're just on mute there. 
just can you would you mind thank you i'll read this slowly as uh, it's the first time uh, the interpreters heard it so i apologize i have been sorry i'm so sorry not to have been able to been to join you today i've been a passionate advocate of working with performers whose first language is bsl since i had the pleasure of directing neil fox in 1997 I was insistent we cast a deaf actor in a Charles Dickens story about a, yet, a young deaf girl, which had been commissioned without any consultation with deaf artists. I had to fight to make sure it was bilingual and I got a lot of things wrong, but I also learned a lot thanks to the amazing support from Paula Garfield amongst others. I really welcome this step forward to ensure best practice and increase confidence in the hearing and deaf theatre community. I have always found BSL to be a profound addition to my process as a hearing director. As the most expressive language I know, it encourages all the performers to bring all of themselves to the work, emotionally and physically. With Shakespeare, working in BSL enables everyone to think deeply about translating Shakespeare's language into emotional and visual expression, which often means it is more honest and thoughtful within the rehearsal room, with greater appreciation for why we still value Shakespeare's plays. On stage, working bilingually, encourages an audience to pay attention with all their senses and almost always creates a unique electricity between performers and audience. I feel very fortunate to have worked with some wonderful deaf performers. A quick shout out to Charlie Arrowsmith, who has led the way at the RSC and been patient and wise as we have improved our practices and approach. I hope this guide will take a burden from the shoulders of deaf colleagues. Deaf performers and directors, in my experience, are alive to the power of theatre in a very particular way. And I, for one, have a great deal more to learn from my deaf friends and colleagues. Congratulations to Paula and everyone who has made today happen. It is such an important piece of work and I look forward to seeing the change it will make possible. Oh, how lovely, lovely speech from Erica Wyman there. And thank you so much to Ellen for reading that out to us. And it's because of we have advocates like you, these uh, industry workers, to spread that change uh, into the industry. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. Just let me double check my timings. Uh, if I have, oh, I'm going to now move on to the question and answer session from the audience. So um, may I just say quickly say goodbye to our panellists. And uh, obviously, as we talked about, if there's a question you would like to answer, please do come back on the screen. So just a, a short goodbye for now. Many questions have been coming in and we will do our best uh, to answer as many as possible and I will do my best to uh, sign them all uh, to, so that there is access for our deaf people watching. Please just give me a moment while I just look through the questions quickly. Okay, the first question that we have been asked is regards to spotlight. That now allows people to indicate their BSL level and their qualifications in BSL to make sure that it is high because, but does it allow you to prove that in any way? Some might say that they have high levels of BSL, but they don't. How can we ensure that, and how can equity uh, support that to ensure that people's BSL use is uh, genuine? If I could respond to that. Please do, Alan. Thank you. I think it's wonderful that Spotlight are including the levels of BSL and consider it to be important because hearing actors may put, oh, I have BSL, but then actually the level that they have is inappropriate. But because of the ignorance of the panel, those people are cast because they're not aware of what a good level would be. So what that does is encourage people to use a BSL monitor in auditions. 
and they should be part of your creative team and your audition panel that can assess those skills. There is nothing wrong with somebody having a lower level of sign language, a conversational equivalent, but we need to assess that and feedback to the panel to check whether that particular actor is right for the part. And also, I think it's something that our deaf contributors need to feedback on as well. May I ask actually, uh, Neil Fox Roberts, uh, as the representative on the uh, equity committee, how do you feel you know, if some people do put on their spotlight profile that they have a higher level uh, of BSL? Is there any kind of evidence and can equity support in that regard? Neil, are you there? Oh, oh here he comes. <clears throat> Excellent. Hello, Hello. Neil. May I just ask, what could we do? What could Equity do? Or uh, and working with Spotlight, if if they do say that they have good levels of BSL, what what can we do to mitigate this? I think um, absolutely, it's it's great that Spotlight are including this, um, and it's something that we can talk about in more detail in the future. And I think absolutely, levels of BSL should be on people's profile, because people need to be aware of how to bring in hearing actors, and if based on their level. So it's important that information is there and it indicates a level of skill. Um, and I also agree with Alan that there must be a BSL monitor included in the creative process. And that person must be a deaf person who can then assess the level of sign language use and feed that back to the rest of the creative team. You know, many directors are not skilled in, in, in being aware of what a good sign language looks like. So having that monitor there is really important. Thank you, Neil. Absolutely. If someone is not aware of uh, sign language, they can just see someone moving their hands and think, oh, that looks beautiful uh, and not know whether they're actually using the language properly or not. So having that advisor, consultant, deaf eye is very important. Thank you, Neil. I also think that there needs to be more deaf people bring, brought in as BSL consultants. I think there are quite a few, few people doing that role at the moment. So perhaps we need to encourage a widening of the pool. I do agree with you there, Neil. Thank you so much for, for that answer. I'll now move on uh, to another question. This question is, and it's a question for our actors on the panel today. How often have you seen BS L advisors in casting panels. So perhaps that's in an audition process. Um, I'd like to ask uh, our actors if they'll pop up to answer. Have you seen consultants in the actual audition panel? Oh, I have Julian. Uh, <laughs> Julian, very short answer. No, <laughs> no, never, never. I have never seen that. Uh, Nadia, now? For me, um, I'd say it's a bit 50-50. If I bring my own interpreter, an interpreter that knows me well, um, there was a, a director producer who asked a good question. So they asked, okay, I don't know BSL. I don't know the language. Could we extend the time for your audition? So normally you get allocated about 10 minutes, but my audition was extended so that they had more time with me to talk to them as me, Nadia, and that they could ask the questions they needed to ask. So they were, that was a positive experience. They seemed prepared. But in most deaf-led theatres, they know who should be in the room. It's, we're more talking about mainstream productions where there's less knowledge. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, over to Sophie now. When I graduated from drama school, I started working. Um, but about two years ago, I was asked to go back to be a panel for hearing and deaf students wanting to audition for that drama school. And I was part of the panel. And I was able to advise on skills because I think the problem is if you don't know sign language, it's difficult to assess the, the talent through the, through the sign language if they're looking at something that they don't understand. So I, they can listen to somebody's voice and assess the skills through a spoken actor, but for a sign language using actor, they're less able to judge more fairly. So my being part of the panel, I could say they have sign language, they have the skills, they have the talent. But in my earlier auditions for uh, the drama school, 
it may be in early auditions for drama school it may be that they don't have those great skills as yet but it's important that you're learning through your education at drama school so i think often there's too much reliance on what people can hear and not and they're not judging the sign language in an equitable way so if more deaf people are involved in those processes to provide guidance to provide feedback they can then break down that barrier thank you sophie i think nadia would like to add something now there are many deaf consultants the, the, the pool of BSL consultants is growing and often they ask the actor to, to, to take that role but I always say no 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 you need to to bring on a BSL consultant um, but in spotlight there isn't mention of BSL consultants because some actors perhaps do voice coaching and BSL consultancy is the equivalent for sign language so if people are, are setting up auditions with deaf actors they often come to me and ask me who to contact. But if those roles were expressed on Spotlight, then that takes a little bit of the, the burden away. You know that they may have skills in consulting on musicals, consulting on Shakespeare, and I think those roles should also be included on Spotlight. And translation, Sophie's just saying. So equivalence given to uh, BSL consultancy, as in voice coaching. Uh, and to use that as a comparison. I think that's interesting. I think that's really good feedback to give to uh, Spotlight and any other sort of acting profiles. Uh, Julian, you wanted to add something, didn't you? Um, just to let you know, there is a, a, a website being launched soon that will have uh, uh, perhaps a, a category for deaf writers, category for BSL monitors. It's called the Deaf TV Collective. Uh, and there will be contact details about interpreters as well. Uh, and there are details about that in this guide as well. Paula, thank you so much to the actors. Um, maybe just stay there for now for my next question in case it's you. Um, so this question is, and uh, just make sure I get the translation right. How can hearing theatre makers be educated in the correct and honest representation of BSL and the deaf community in their production. So if, they, if a hearing theatre maker wanted to make a play uh, for deaf, the deaf community, how can they be educated to do it in the right way? Uh, perhaps they don't have uh, sign language in their background. How, how can they be educated? Uh, and and what, what advice could we give to theatre makers is the question. Over to Nadia first. I was just thinking um, over my career, I'm always the, the only deaf person in a hearing ensemble. And I always talk to directors or producer and say on the first day, would you mind if I did a deaf awareness session? You know, and I will talk about different types of deafness. I will talk about the different languages that deaf people use. I will talk about the cultural aspects of the community because often we talk about language, but we don't talk about the cultural element of the community because without the culture, what is the language? So I talk about both where the culture comes from, how that influences the language, and there's not much taught about that. So I tend to teach that on the first day of rehearsals, which means that the hearing members of the cast can start to incorporate that within the, the ongoing rehearsal process. So if it happens on that very first day, it seems to be a really positive process. So that would be my idea. Uh, Julian wants to respond there. Julian, I think in theatre rehearsals, absolutely that's great to happen but tv is a bit different obviously it's uh, obviously a bit more last minute there's not as many rehearsals and uh, you know almost like it's you know deaf awareness on the spot and they don't want time to uh, be eaten into their busy schedules and i think you know we have to sort of you know work with them before uh, perhaps email before and sort of you know say some deaf awareness please make sure you look at me when you speak to me please make sure there's something on the bottom of the call sheet if you're working on tv production about being face to face good lighting etc uh how to work with an interpreter so that when you arrive it's it's there on, on the set kind of thing um and so i think that it's really important to get that information across whether you have a bsl consultant or not and to make sure that it is included uh, beforehand there's lots of preparation to do uh over to sophie also, I've noticed during the lockdown process that lots of writers have come to me and said that they want to write something for a deaf character. What should I consider? What shouldn't I do? What should I remove? 
can you read my script and give me some feedback? And it's interesting, when you're considering incorporating a deaf actor, it's about consulting people from the very beginning so that that feedback, that information about culture, about the intrinsic detail happens right at the beginning so that it's part of the process already, you've already involved with the deaf community. There's no point in, in writing something without consulting and then the first time a deaf person is involved is at the audition process. You've lost all the detail, all the nuances, the truth, uh, the authenticity, the authentic experience of a deaf person. If you leave it until that moment when a deaf actor walks in and when another deaf actor looks at the script and says, actually, deaf people don't do this. Um, it then becomes a bit a debate. The deaf person starts to look difficult and it's like, actually, no. That deaf person is talking about the real experience and your script does not reflect that real experience. So incorporating the deaf community right at the beginning is absolutely crucial. Thank you. Uh, I hope that's a good response to the question that was asked about how hearing theatre makers can make their plays more ex accessible for deaf uh, community members. It's about employing uh, deaf associates, deaf consultants, deaf actors and uh, deaf people being able to lead that that process and, and really influencing. I do hope that that responds to the question. Thank you so much to our actors. Uh, moving on uh, to my next question. This is actually for Kerry, for Kerry Michael and Amy. Uh, Amy, Amy, wrong sign name, a different Amy there, but uh, for Kerry and uh, Amy. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, for popping up. Uh, yeah, I know another Amy, I'm using the wrong sign there. But anyway, <laughs> just let me get the question and let me just read it quickly. I just need some time to read and translate that in my in my mind. So forgive my my uh, momentary pause. I know that both of you, obviously, we've known that, that you uh, led your various productions. Did you work with uh, perhaps a deaf consultant or a co-director or an assistant director who then integrated uh, into Tommy? and into Oliver Twist, the, the sign language. And if not, uh, well, obviously share your experiences, but would you mind sharing a bit more about the, uh, the creative team and, and how that person was involved in your creative team? Who did you have uh, in the rehearsal room that supported this process of good BSL practice in the arts if there was no uh, deaf co-director or assistant director or consultant etc so over to you both who would like to start uh answering that <laughs> you're both too polite aren't you <laughs> let's have a hand up hand up oh i'm gonna go with kerry kerry there we are over to kerry <laughs> thank you okay. um yeah we had um uh Dow jackson who's a native bsl user was there at the beginning as a creator consultant and he was with jenny draper who's a brilliant interpreter. They were there from the very beginning at all the audition processes, at a lot of the planning meetings um, where we talked about how we integrate the BSL into the storytelling and how we add an extra layer of storytelling. We did lots of talking about when we want actors to come in and sing, well, how do you sing if, if you're a native BSL user and how do you sing with your hands? How do you sing with your with, with, with in, in other ways? So we had to kind of do a lot of rethinking about our terminology in the in the process, um, and then also um, in our process in particular, we had Mark Smith, who was our choreographer, and he's a deaf choreographer, and he was there at the heart of everything too. Thank you, thank you, Kerry, for that answer. Uh, yes, Amy, please. Thank you. Yeah, and on Oliver Twist, again, we worked with a whole array of people. So like I mentioned, we started with, um, before Bryony wrote any of the scripts at all, we started with an R&D week where we worked with a whole range of deaf actors and artists to start to develop the script from the beginning. Um, through the process, again, we worked with Daryl Jackson as BSL consultant and also Jenny Seeley was our dramaturg on the show as well. Uh, we had an assistant director who um, is a native BSL user as well, the brilliant Adam Bassett. Um, and I suppose the thing about Oliver Twist was because it was a new adaptation 
adaptation, the script itself was always a, a blueprint that we knew could keep changing and shifting as rehearsals went along as well. So it could be very organic in how it responded to the discoveries we made through rehearsals and even trying to figure out how to uh, record BSL on the page is quite a difficult thing to do. So how do we actually put that into practice um, in the kind of script as well? Um, it's worth saying also that these shows, Tommy and Oliver Twist are huge productions. And I'm aware, I think there's another question about what if you're on a much smaller show? Of course, Paula, we worked together on a much smaller show, didn't we, at Christmas, um, where Paula was our BSL consultant on that, and we had a deaf assistant director, but it was a much smaller production. We just had two actors, and it was much smaller, so it doesn't have to have as many people as we had on Oliver Twist and Tommy. It can be reduced as well. Thank you for that, uh, Amy and, and Kerry. And I think it just shows that there are, if there are deaf professionals involved in the creative process from the start, it makes it much more successful. It's not that you then suddenly as an afterthought bring in uh, a deaf person. It's, it, it's really important to have that creativity and that consultants in from the beginning of the process. I think that is the good practice. Uh, and, and obviously that is reflected in the guide. Thank you both uh, Kerry and Amy for those answers. Let me turn now to uh, the next question. Okay. And really this can be for anybody. So the next question, how can uh, smaller theatre companies, potentially fringe theatre companies, how can they best work with deaf actors if they have a very small budget? I think Amy just touched on, you know, if uh, bigger bu budgets like the Ramps of the Moon uh, consortium, etc., uh, have a lot of people involved. How can newer companies or smaller companies or fringe companies work with deaf actors effectively and BSL representation effectively? Oh, and uh, firstly, over to Nadia to answer that. I've worked with a very small theatre company recently, and it didn't feel very different from working with a larger company. Um, I just wanted to add a word um, that's important for you to know, access to work, which is abbreviated as ATW, that pays the fees of an interpreter. And we would require two interpreters every day, regardless of the number of people in the cast, because we're working with two languages in the rehearsal space, and it's not possible for an interpreter to work all day solo. So before you wish to employ a deaf actor, please apply to the Arts Council in your application and consider an additional budget for access, regardless of how the size of your company. If you consider that fee within your initial budget, then regardless of how big that budget is, if that access is already in there, then we can work with you and use part of our access to work budget and we can work together to, to support the fees of the interpreters. Thank you for that, Nadia. I really appreciate that. Oh, Sophie's popped up. Would you like to add something, Sophie? Just, I've also noticed that the smaller companies that don't have those larger budgets can work with the use of creative captions in order to provide access to the deaf audience. So it's thinking about what can we do when we don't have money? So think collaboratively, think across the team. I think big theatres have to consider a number of responsibilities and they have to put money in lots of different pots in terms of providing access. But if you think about access creatively, Often access cannot be a priority. It sits at the bottom of a long list of things that you have to do. A smaller company, when it's more of an ensemble, where everyone is working together and everyone contributes, then they could create something really special in terms of access in comparison to the larger the theatres that often leave access to the bottom of the list. And perhaps the larger companies can learn from the work that smaller companies are doing with little or no money and still achieving Good, good quality productions. Money isn't everything, it's about imagination. And it's using what you have, working as a team to create an accessible performance in a different way. 
Thank you for that, Sophie. I think that's really useful advice to uh, emerging theatre companies, to new theatre companies, or even existing theatre companies that are on the smaller scale. Moving on now to the next question, and this one is for Faye, Faye Timby from the Sophie Holland Casting. So uh, we'll wait. welcome Faye. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, Faye. And let me just uh, read the question here for you, Faye. It is, how can we encourage casting directors to cast deaf actors in non-deaf roles? Mm. Your views on that one? It's a really good question. I, I think a lot of it comes down to visibility. Um, I think we've seen an increase of deaf actors on screen in the last few years. Um, people like uh, Daniel Durant in You, which was a huge Netflix series, um, Sean Beardy in The Society, uh, Chella Mann in Titans, and I know most recently the BBC cast um, Rose Ailing Ellis in EastEnders. Um, I think also resources up until now have been really limited, so hopefully this document will prove invaluable because we can use it as a go-to bible for the industry and for casting offices in particular because it goes into great detail about the best way of running an audition room and where we can find interpreters and funding for interpreters and how best to support deaf actors um, on set and in a rehearsal room. Um, I think also there's a huge misconception um, in the industry that casting directors are you know the gatekeepers but actually anyone who works in casting will know, there are often a multitude of hoops to jump through and a long list of producers and creatives who have to sign off on an actor um, before they're able to be cast. Um, but what I hope this document will do is enrich our understanding of the deaf community um, and bring about more opportunities for us to see deaf actors on stage and screen and also provide a foundation from which we can start to see deaf performers on screen in more leading roles and not just as token deaf characters. And I do think that that is starting to happen. I just think it's going to be a more of a gradual process. Um, but that's why I think this document is so wonderful because I think that it will assist us in being able to do that. Thank you, Faye. Yes, yes, we can. <laughs> and I would, I'd like to see more deaf people on screen. Uh, and it's not a role that's a victim. Uh, I think that's, I think a lot of the times we see, you know, deaf people as victims. Like for example, I think Julian shared earlier, you know, that they bring in deaf children because it's a kind of a quick fix. It ticks their box. Oh, I see Julian's popped up now. Would you like to add more to that? Julian, yes, I'd just like to um, support Faye's answer to that question, really, because I think, you know, seeing um, deaf stories on TV, how many are there in a year? One, perhaps two. So all of us, are, all of us actors, we're waiting for this deaf story and then it comes up and we're quite excited. And then all of a sudden, oh, there's a huge lull because I think, um, you know, perhaps they're only thinking that it's a deaf story that I have to use a deaf actor. But that's that shouldn't be the case. You know, we are um, in everyday life. You know, maybe it's an ad advert who's uh, looking for a 40 plus male. I'm just uh, giving away my age there. But maybe it's looking for a, you know, a 40 plus chap. I should be able to apply. But even if the breakdown doesn't say deaf, you know, I am a man who is 40 plus. And but I am I happen to be deaf. So therefore I could be in it. And there, therefore, we could go for more roles, um, perhaps if they'd never thought about using a deaf actor. And I think with having this guide, just as Faye's been sharing, hopefully it will open people's minds, not just casting directors, producers, writers, really open the minds to, to give deaf actors opportunities that are not just in deaf roles. That would be fantastic. Paula. I was just waiting for the interpreter to finish. Yes, I, I, I signed a few words and she's taking ages to, to, to say all that. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Finished, finished, finished. Thank you, Susan, thank you. Ah, uh, Paula, I just wanted to respond to that really. Um, that's such a good point. And I'm so pleased to have 
uh, a representative from the casting industry uh, play with us today to really sort of you know really support and advocate this change and really to, to enforce this resource and share this resource you know and as we've been saying it's time for change 2020 is now um we don't want to see any more deaf victims on tv that they're always playing a victim it's something associated with deafness you know why can't the deaf person be the devil uh yeah julian wants to be the criminal the murderer absolutely um you know james bond even being deaf for example you know 007 says paula why not you know we could play anything it doesn't have to be linked with deafness not at all oh i think my time might be up thank you so much to the people on the screen um i just want to say thank you so much to everybody for participating in this panel discussion for the last 90 minutes. I'd like to say firstly, thank you to Alan Jader uh, for creating this guide. Um, and I just to share about myself, I was a freelance actor for, you know, gosh, 30 years ago now. Um, you know, gosh, I first started acting 30 years ago and the barriers, unfortunately, are still there now. And it's time to make this, these changes. We really do need to make these changes. I've seen it happen over and over again, but now having these guidelines endorsed by equity that will be a resource that hopefully we can break those barriers down and really see the careers flourishing for deaf people. And I really hope we see more employment and more opportunities uh, for deaf people. Thank you so much to all my panelists today for your contribution and for your time. A huge thank you to Equity for working with us to launch this guidelines. I really do appreciate it. Thanks also to uh, my team members, uh, Ian Street and uh, Alex Turner, who have been behind the scenes there hosting this webinar and been invaluable in making sure that the technology has worked worked well. Thank you so much also to our wonderful interpreters, to uh, Susan Booth and Kathy Yeoman for uh, voicing and signing throughout this session to make it accessible to everybody. And can I say thank you for watching this webinar session. Um, and we've had uh, over 30 questions and I'm so sorry that uh, in our time slot, um, we weren't able to answer all of them. And oh, welcome back to uh, Alan Jada for your, your final words uh, to sum up. I just wanted to let you know that the guide is officially live. And if you want to know where to find it, it's www.equity.org dot uk slash bsl guide and it will be provided in different versions large print audio and there will be a bsl translated version this has been recorded today so please share this via the hashtag equity bsl thank you everybody for watching and just one final comment don't go just yet just uh, just to let you know when you do attempt to uh, leave this meeting there will be a small questionnaire that will pop up on your screen at the end of this so please do take a moment just to fill that in for our information uh, that would be really useful thank you so much for participating and goodbye